Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining this, uh, this session and for, for being here with us at the New City Summit. Um, I'm really, really excited. My name is Mathieu Lefebvre. I'm the executive director of the New Cities Foundation. And I'm uh, extremely excited to be uh, the moderator for, for this panel, uh, which we, we really wanted to uh, have uh, at the front of this program because I think the question of governance and who decides for cities and ever expanding cities and smarter cities, et cetera, the question of decision making and governance for cities that we think is a really central one. Um, and so I'm, I'm really delighted to be moderating this, this panel and we have a, an exceptional uh, panel around me. Um, let me just introduce uh, the, the, the speakers uh, in, in, uh, who, who are around me. Um, on my left is uh, Steve, Stephen Goldsmith, who's a professor at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, he's a former mayor of Indianapolis and former deputy mayor of the great city of New York. Um, to his left is um, Tony Williams, who is a lecturer at the Harvard Kennedy School uh, and a former two-term mayor of the great city of Washington, D.C. Um, all the way on my right is Professor Patrick Le Gades from uh, Sciences Po. And here to my right is Anil Menon, who is the president of Globalization and Smart and Connected Communities at Cisco. So welcome all and thank you all to the, your speakers for, for joining us uh, this morning. Um, to kick us off, um, I wanted to ask uh, Patrick Le Gales, uh, to sort of set the stage for us um, uh, from Sciences Po um, and, and to kind of frame the discussion we'll be having. So please, Professor Le Gales. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation to this uh, great event. And the question we start with is decision-making, governance, and what sort of things we can say. And one of the interesting things about governance is that we have very different views from various parts of the world. When you ask this question from Shanghai, oh, I'm trying to get my slide to start. Yep. He doesn't. There goes somewhere or from other parts of the world who have different views. This panel is also interesting because we are from different continents and we may have some different things. So new governance for new cities. The first thing when you think about those issues is that, you know, trying to understand new governance, public-private partnership, you know, they are not new subject, of course. The Greeks were thinking about public-private partnerships and the Romans were doing that quite well as well. Mayor Robertson from Vancouver this morning said, running a city is a tough business. We do agree. We do agree a lot that governing this big thing is complicated. And the problem is that, do you run a city, do you rule a city, or do you govern a real city? You try to change things. We were told this morning by Professor West that we should not worry too much because 75% of what is going on in cities is not changed by either technology or public policy, which is probably right if you take everything all together. However, at the end of the day, the way you govern and the public policy implemented make massive change for the population of the cities. So I think he raises a very important issues. Yes, government governs. Yeah, you know, students study, workers work, but there are lots of things which are not governed. And I think the issue of governance today in all those large cities is precisely to know what can really be governed, where the effort should be. It's not, you know, not so easy to think that everything can be governed with new technology. So what I want to do really is to remember two things. Number one, that we have been saying this morning, and we say that all the time, we have one big urban world. And so lots of solutions are replicable, which is true. And more people are mobile. This is absolutely correct. But at the same time, we have to think about things becoming the same and things becoming and uh, remaining extraordinarily different or becoming more and more different. And I think the difficulty in governance issues and public policy is to think of two things at the same time. Lots of things in cities are becoming similar, and you can think about the same solutions. And on the other end, lots of cities are becoming more and more differentiated. If you think about urban growth, we all say more urbanization, but we also have shrinking cities. We also have cities in Africa losing population. So we have to think about those two dimensions at the same time. And it's always easy to show that when you govern Shanghai, some solutions may be the same than in Los Angeles or Paris, but maybe not. Not always. And you have always to combine these two elements. When you govern Bogota, yes, you govern Bogota. What do you really govern? I think it's more than 75 which is not governed in Bogota in all sorts of ways. So that's the first point. 
when you govern Pretoria, you have a different views of the world. You govern young people, always a problem. You have young people around, you know, how do you govern these people? It's always a problem. The second point I want to make is when you govern, there are some risks of thinking. There are views which in rough solutions we can govern this way. So I want to do two things. I want to identify those risks to see the limits of these great ideas and just to remind you that to govern is an old activity that we know a lot about what it means, you know, to tax, to develop public policies, to regulate markets, to organize elections. There are some classic things, and that's, you know, you have to do these things in all sorts of cities. And I want to identify five classic ideas about government and governance in those cities, which are both very important, but also with limits. So governance is always about combination. We take innovation, public-private partnership, NGOs. It's always about combination. So let's think about the limits. The first limit I want to emphasize is, well, you know, cities are big, they're complex, so they are ungovernable. You know, they are fluid, people are mobile, everything is changing all the time, change is accelerating, so there's not much you can do. I think this is historically wrong. In a way, yes, change is always there, but on the other end, there are lots of things at the same time which are not changing too much in cities. And when you look at buildings, you look at religion, you look at families, you look sometimes at various organizations or who own the land, you see that lots of structures are very stable. I used to take my American friends to Florence to show them the Antinori family making wine, and they owned a lot of the land for, since the 12th century. So when you do public-private partnership in Florence, you have to deal with people who have been there for 800 years. Okay, it's old Europe, I know. But you know, still, we have to think about these two things at the same time. The second idea you have is that, oh, to get good public policy, good decision making, you need the right institution. We do that in political science. Let's design the exact wonderful institutions and think we'll work better. Well, sometimes it helps, but very often it doesn't make a big difference. So do not emphasize too much the idea that the right institutions will change everything. So it's very thinking like, you know, cities will replace state. Well, I would argue that cities have more and more autonomy and capacity to do things, but they do not replace states so far. Some of them might but not so much. And you have long-term impact of institutions which do not explain very much the change in terms of governance and public policy. The third classic idea, and Matthew mentioned that a little bit, you have to take the right decision. We like decisions. Right? Heroic leaders with visions, good experts, good information system, taking the right decisions will change the cities very much. Yes and no, again, of course it's very important, but as we know, I'm sure the mayors will mention that, the capacity to govern is about implementation, implementation, and implementation. So the decision-making process, in fact, is not very important. In lots of domain, you can take lots of decisions. But the problem is whether they are implemented and for whom. And this question of implementation requires to think about governance less about who takes decisions, but about all the people who can protest, manipulate, change, oppose, or get unintended consequences. So think about decisions, but much importantly, what about the uh, implementation? And that raises all sorts of issues in terms of democracy and protest. Cities are places where lots of people protest. Must always remember that. Technology, we mentioned that this morning, very important. We emphasize the importance of large technical systems, new information data. This is really what is bringing lots of change in lots of cities, but we also know that in the past, very often, new technological systems on their own have either failed, did not deliver, or did not include everybody, and you know, who has access to what? There are lots of questions, so it's never on its own technology. It's always combined with something else. So never follow too much the technological determinism, I would say. And the fifth thing, you know, my job is to be provocative this morning, okay? That's what Matthew said. Is of course, to try to follow, um, let's find the best practice, the good governance, now the smart regulations, all these are very exciting ideas. Well, the problem is that when you look at best practices 10 years later, you know, we are academic, we're slow. We look at things systematically with database on the long term. We find that lots of best practices were not very good. We find that good governance meant not very much in lots of places. So again, good governance, best practices for whom? To do what? With which results? Implementation results. That's where we have to focus on all these issues of governance. To finish off, I want to just point, in the last two minutes, uh, a couple of points about what we see in lots of cities if we compare lots of big cities in the world and the governance and governing things. 
But as I tried to mention before, I think one of the key elements is to understand that lots of parts of the cities are not very much either regulated or governed. Hence the importance of the theme of today, of thinking about various partnerships with various organizations, about innovations, about open data, about sharing information and thinking collectively, because it's a bloody hard job to govern a city, and the mayors will mention that. You know, the hidden secret is that lots of policies fail. Lots of decisions are not implemented. Lots of big policies lead to consequences which were not anticipated. The social world is a little bit complicated. In other words, one of the key questions in governing cities is also who is governed. And these people that you try to govern, and you try to govern more than the people, you try to govern also the biosphere or the natural spaces, you know, they have a life on their own. And that was Api wonderfully mentioned this morning. We see several points, I think, which you have to keep in mind on this governance debate. Number one, we see a long-term trend in lots of countries where you know, major cities have more and more political autonomy, more resources, more capacity to govern. And this is true from in every continent, not always, not everywhere. There's a long-term trend where we see more governing capacity at the level of cities. Cities do not replace states. It's multi-level all the time. But we see this dynamism going on, and that's very important. More resources are there. Which does not mean that they are completely free. When I use the term freer actors, more rules. Cities have more capacity to govern themselves, but there are also new rules, new regulations, new constraints coming in from national government very often. So it's a funny world. They have more autonomy, but sometimes they have more constraints, financial or, or law, legal constraints. The second point is I think most people in the world now have understood that cities are important for economic growth and for social development. So there's a you know, long-term investment in cities which is going on. Whether we'll have a return to investment is something. Third thing was mentioned this morning, yes, there's more mobility, of course. More mobility of ideas, of technologies, of individuals, of capital, of policy solutions. However, can I just remind you that looking at mobility on its own very often does not make much sense because lots of policies are also rooted. Lots of people at the same time are mobile and rooted somewhere. Lots of ideas come from somewhere and have some logic of their own. So again, you do not concentrate just on mobility. You always have to think, yes, people are mobile and they send their children to school. So people at the same time, and I think this morning, the example from Cisco is very good. You think about Rotterdam and you think about the world at the same time. So we have mobility, but sometimes we think, oh, you know, mobility is everything. No, you, everybody is a bit more mobile in many ways, but also choosing where people uh, choose to live. The big change for cities is that people choose where they live. So of course they're mobile, but because they choose where to go more and more, and they have more capacity to choose, where they live and where they are rooted is more important than, or at least as important than their mobility. Again, think about the two things at the same time, rather than opposing them. The big thing, of course, is to sustainable development. Lots of people talk about that. And we see this amazing importance of knowledge. It was mentioned this morning that the production of data is absolutely central. And to govern is to rationalize. Remember, governing in the modern sense of a state in the 17th century, when you produced new technologies of government, statistics, census, and all these sort of things. Clearly, all this new production of information, more or less open, we shall see, uh, will be and is changing already the way uh, you can govern all these things. I remember also that when you talk about governance, that will be my, my last point, you talk about lots of people, you talk about protest, you talk about revolt sometimes, you talk about riots. One of the main social phenomena in the cities is, of course, riots. So you have to remember that it's not just smart and, and smart regulation. You know, riots are not the consequence of smart regulation. So issues like um, who governs when nobody governs is interesting. There are lots of places in cities which are not governed because we are in slums, and that was the point of Rosemain this morning. Slums in large cities have very important part, and they are part of a city, and they are a place for social change. But they are also a place for awful things going on in all sorts of ways. So when nobody governs, my point is governance is about politics, of course, and when nobody governs, you may have lots of private regulations going on, sometimes very good idea with market firms sometimes, sometimes very bad one. Who governs waste disposal in Napoli? You also know that in these governance issues, one of the long-term consequences are corruption and transparency. 
So these are very strong political elements which have long-term consequence on the development of cities. And of course, inequalities is massive. You know, this is the main problem for large cities. It's just the massive, not less in the West, of course, but massive inequalities in South America, for instance. So when you think about governance and economic development and sustainable development, do not lose sight of this basic element of what politics is about in cities or at the state level, because it's even more important in cities. So to conclude, governing the urban world, well, we don't have quick fix. And we, have, we know, and I think I plea that, we should spend more time looking at the failures. Lots of governing initiatives uh, not always work very well. We do lots of private public partnerships. Some of them are fantastic. Some of them just fail miserably. Sometimes the fact that you have some very strong public sector is wonderful for development of cities. Sometimes it's awful. It takes resources and does nothing. Same thing for markets, for firms. So we have to think this combination all the time. The problem is how we think in terms of collective action and how we combine different elements with our moving insight of, of these people. I mentioned already this who is governed. Can I just conclude on this thing? To govern, of course, is to implement public policies, to try to change the existing situation, to produce innovations, to improve the conditions of lives of various people. But to think on the long term, we know that governance is about power relations. And I think well, even if we talk about innovation, even if we talk about this information system, which is so fascinating for all of us, we have to remember that if you want to have some long-term impact on the city, that means that you have to think about these power relations. Who owns the land? Who has access to data? What resources are available for various groups? And I'm not just saying, you know, we all do participative democracy and the world would be much better. It doesn't work like that. But those issues of, you know, if we think about sustainable development, those elements, governing is about politics. And politics is about collective action. And that's, I think, the subject of today is how we organize collective actions and virtuous circle to try to achieve some change. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Professor. That was uh, extremely uh, uh, interesting, provocative, and I think will set us off on, on, on the right uh, direction. Uh, I want to turn now to, uh, to Mayor Williams, um, who bridging from the, 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 the academic to the academic slash world of City Hall. Um, and I want to ask you, uh, uh, reacting to what Professor Le Gares was saying, I mean, should we look more at failure or, uh, you know, do we need, what is the role of innovation in city government and are we making too much of this? Well, I'm speaking to all of you really, I mean, I, I teach as an adjunct professor, but I really am speaking out of practice and practical experience. And you could say, uh, one of our speakers is talking about smart and connected cities. I mean, on one level, what you're trying to do as a mayor is avoid a dumb and disconnected city. So, I mean, uh -huh. on, you know, at a very practical level, uh, that's what you're trying to do. I mean, think of an analogy. We think of the uh, soaring ego as a symbol, uh, for example, of the United States, right? Well, when you're a mayor, you're soaring, yes, but you're making your, liv making your living you know, with a nitty gritty hunting and gathering, a mayor is a very, very practical job. Uh, one mayor, Normanetta, went on to uh, high federal positions, but he's famous for a lady coming into his office saying, I want to speak to the mayor, and I don't want to speak to anyone lower than the mayor. And he leaned out the door and he said, there is no one lower than the mayor. Because when you're the mayor, you really are on a very practical level, which brings up three points. First of all, when you're trying to govern a city, you really are governing as a minimum. You're governing as something necessary, but your executive function is sufficient. It's, it's, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient in the sense that as a mayor, you're really leading what I would call the public realm. So for example, Washington DC, the larger Washington DC community is an example of the public realm designed by L'Enfant, right? People say he was looking at Paris, no, he was looking at Versailles and he was repudiating the private realm of Versailles to create this public realm of a Washington DC. So what does it mean to lead this public realm? It means that you're working as a participant with, coordinating, facilitating this whole network of relationships and people of which you're a part. You're facilitating, but you're also a part. It's a public, it's a private, it's a worker, it's a business, it's the secular, it's a clerical. All of this is a public realm and the building blocks of the public realm 
are, I would argue, as a financial person, the cornerstone is public trust and accountability, public safety, public education, uh, public knowledge. All these things constitute the public realm. And to make all this work, needless to say, requires a lot of innovation. Now, also to make all this work, number two, requires you as a participant to all, and as a director, as a facilitator, also be a referee. And what do I mean by that? You're a referee in all these interminable conflicts that are going on in this realm. So, for example, there's, needless to say, when you're a mayor, there's a conflict between the short term and the long term. I always used to say you have to go out on the balcony periodically and throw out some red meat to keep the crowd happy while you focused on the long-term goal of really moving the city forward. People say there's this big uh, antipathy and big uh, contrast between business and government because government is, you know, people want everything yesterday and business is so, so much more rational. I actually find that the short-term investor, the hedge investor, and your constituent at your neighborhood meeting, there's a lot of similarity. They want everything tonight, right? They want everything right now. So this short term versus the long term, we've already heard the political versus the rational, right? Big, the public versus the private, all of these issues you're trying to navigate and they all require innovation, which brings my last point. Uh, the mayor of Vancouver in our plenary session was talking about how he was hit with a 50 year snowfall. Now he clearly had to, at that moment, innovate. He couldn't go to a meeting where all his constituents are screaming and saying, well, I don't have any plows. I mean, he could try to say that, but he's got to innovate and provide some real-time solutions. When you're trying to govern this realm, govern, govern as we define it, this realm, it requires that you have solutions in real time, right? You can't punt. When you're trying to lead this realm and lead this city, people expect you to be responsible of ev for everything Pretty much everything, I would say, except maybe national defense. They probably don't hold you responsible for wars. But other than that, when you're leading a city, you're responsible for everything. You've got to come up with real solutions. I'll give you an example, and, and, and I'll wrap up. In my uh, 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 time as mayor, uh, and I, uh, where we came up with a solution that required this network uh, to solve a real problem. We had a hospital where we were paying literally hundreds of millions of dollars to support a public hospital where essentially if you were poor in the city, you would go to the public hospital to get critical care, substandard critical care if you were about ready to die. And that's the only way you got health care. You had to go to the poor person's hospital. And we had built up this culture where everyone believed in the poor precincts of the city that you had to go to this general hospital to receive your care. And I tried to deconstruct that and blow that up and say, you know, if you're a poor person, why should you have to go to the poor person's hospital? Why can't you have a choice of where you get care? Why can't you get primary neighborhood-based preventative care and have a choice of quality care anywhere in the city? Where everybody thought this was crazy, it was very, very difficult, the political and the rational, short-term, long-term, but we actually got it through, and now everybody thinks it's a great, uh, great idea. Now we actually, in Washington, D.C., if you considered us a state, we would have the second best coverage of any state in the United States because we tried to work through these relationships, we tried to innovate to solve real problems in real time. Thanks, thanks very much. <coughs> I, 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 I really like, as you were speaking, I was, I was just seeing the, the mayor in a referee's uh, uniform. Yeah. I think that should be, maybe be, be standard. Uh, mayor Rowley, can I just ask you a, a follow-up question? Because as you mentioned, you have a lot of experience in, in public finance and sort of being the referee in that that field. Um, and of course, it's, it's a key field in cities all over the world. Um, what are, are, are some of the, the, the experiences or, or n particular needs for innovation or, or the way forward in, in improving public finance in, in cities? I think there, there are two schools of thought. One school of thought uh, in innovation of finance, which is a dominant school, and I hope it loses uh, traction and stature because I no longer believe in it as much, is that essentially what we need is that throughout uh, governments uh, around the world and certainly around the U.S. and the states is you need uh, better information. You need better management information. And if we only had better management information, all the stakeholders would behave better and perform better. 
Well, in the abstract, I think managerial cost accounting, again, I'm speaking as a finance person, I think this is wonderful stuff. Well, it would be great to know how much it costs to pick up garbage in Washington, D.C., and compare that with how much it picks up, how much it costs to pick up garbage, let's say, in San Francisco versus Paris versus Bangalore. While this would be nice, this kind of thousand mile front of trying to reform government right on a kind of linear basis, we're all going to be dead by the time this happens. So someone in our uh, speaking room was talking about Mayor Menino and the urban mechanics approach. That approach basically says we need to blow this up and deconstruct and try to disrupt and create, cent I don't know, centers of excellence, centers of activity that promote the kind of uh, change in financial thinking that's required. And I'm actually a big believer in that. So in other words, how do you create, to use a hackneyed phrase, public-private partnerships initiatives that require in and of themselves intrinsically better thinking about financial management? And that, I think, is a way to create a virtuous, virtuous cycle when the flywheel and get the ball going. Great. Thanks, thanks a lot. And, and you mentioned uh, the Office of New, New Urban Mechanics, and I know that they're here somewhere, maybe not in this room, but, but they're here. I, I'd love to, to ask uh, all of you in, in your remarks for, for some examples of, of you know, good examples, or as Professor Lugares was suggesting, you know, maybe failures that, that we, should, we should look at and learn from. Um, thanks a lot, Mayor Williams. Let me turn to, um, to Anil Menon. Um, as the, the only representative on this panel of, of, of the business community, we were talking uh, in, in Mayor Williams' remark, he was talking about the mayor as referee of a lot of conflicts, in particular a conflict between you know, government and business. I mean, is there a conflict between government and business? And more broadly, um, what, if anything, should the role of business be in, in, in governance, innovation, and governance of cities? Uh, no, let, let, me, um, let me start with that um, dichotomy between uh, conflicts between government and business. I don't think there should be, but there will be. As long as uh, you have different conflicting goals, different objectives, you are going to see an adversarial relationship. It is a reality of the game, regardless of which place where you are. Let me, let me um, start with this basic point. You heard uh, when we talk about urbanization, uh, um, uh, the whole notion that this is unsustainable in the current con construct, whether it is in Paris or London or whether it's in India or in China. Um, so you think in terms of innovation. So I, I ask a basic question. Why is there urbanization? Why do people pick up from rural communities and move to urban communities and live in very difficult circumstances? It's because of lack of urban services. It's lack of health care, education, jobs, and culture. So if you start with that premise and you ask the question, is there a role of technology or business in changing that dynamic, so that you can take healthcare jobs and, and education to rural communities, would that migration change? Now that in itself is not gonna solve urbanization because if you take cities on an average, 60 to 70% of growth of cities are not coming from migration, it is internal. Uh, and so in that sense, you only solve for half the problem. Uh, so let me just take the question that you asked, which is, and I, 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 I lean on, you know, as a former academic, um, on the work of Paul Romer, who is now at NYU, who has created a business uh, a center called uh, Cities as Startup. And Paul uh, has done a fabulous stream of research that talks about how do countries and cities grow? Is it through uh, innovation or using innovation? And so if you think in terms of exogenous growth and end endogenous growth, that is things that you can bring in, whether it's labor or capital, versus what do you do with it? And how do you create innovation? So you connect it back to Professor uh, this morning who was speaking where he talked about as you get older as a human being, your metabolic rate slows down and cities actually, they can scale. That's all about innovation. Once you get a critical mass of talent, then they can work with that ecosystem and actually create more and more innovations. That's the reason why Bangalore is Bangalore. It's not because people love the infrastructure of Bangalore, even the weather of Bangalore, but there was a critical mass of HCL and Wipros and TCS. That's why Cisco decided to put its second headquarters in Bangalore because we could leverage that ecosystem and then scale much more quickly. And ba businesses have a responsibility in the terms of innovation. They have a responsibility in asking the question, as Wim was talking about the traffic problems. Why are there traffic problems? And so working with Amsterdam, the city of Amsterdam, we figured out that a lot of the city traffic in the peak hours was for government services. So we created smart work centers on the periphery so that you can take 
the government services to a different location so you don't have to drive into the inner city to get access to it. By framing that question differently, you can create for yourself new things. That is the role of business. The business is there, and you know, go back to the old PPP, which is the Pacific Railroad in the US that transformed the US. Well, if you go back and study that, going back to Dean Drew and Rockefeller and Vanderbilt, and what they did in order to put that Pacific Railroad in place, I don't think any one of them will be sitting outside a prison today. I mean, the fact of the matter is that is how cities were built then, that is how cities will be built today. Uh, and as long as their governance is not structured in a correct way, you'll find ways to work around it. So to me, innovation is something that cities can uh, help businesses enable. Now, I just want to finish my point here with this point. It is not, it is not appropriate. I don't, I don't see businesses investing in the infrastructure on which innovation can take place. That investments of the fiber, investments of the roads, investment of the physical infrastructure is something that the government will have to enable through rules and policies and procedures. That is not something that a private enterprise will, uh, will take on themselves. However, it is perfectly appropriate to ask the private enterprise, now that the urban mechanics, Mayor Menino stuff, where you have connected with the Google Maps, where a citizen can take a picture of a pothole, upload it on the system, and then you can monitor it. There are businesses who can monetize that. There are businesses who can create business uh, systems around it. Look at Apple. I mean, it's created an entire stream of innovation, entire stream of entrepreneurs who are probably delivering applications on top of that platform. So I think the nature of what the city needs to be, the nature of what the city governance ought to be is gonna change. We haven't thought through it. Many of the cities today are run, and, and Mayor Goldsmith will agree with that, even if you think a great city like New York, which is my hometown, the cities have been on policies of over 150 years, 140 years. You know, you can keep rebuilding, reconstructing it, but like software, there's nothing more brittle than software where you have to put patches on it. You keep putting patches on a software, at some point it just implodes, it just doesn't work. And the same thing with cities. And today we are building cities, we are revitalizing cities without changing the underlying basic construct of what the city is all about. And so I think businesses do have a role to play, but up to a certain point. And this public-private partnership, I don't think anyone has cracked the code because public-private partnerships, unfortunately, is for businesses trying to avoid the risk and governments trying to avoid the cost. And unfortunately, that is not a very good solution for public-private partnerships, but that is the <laughs> construct we have today. Great, thanks very much. Neil, if I may, I just want to ask you two very quick um, uh, follow-up questions. I mean, you, you in your global role um, uh, at Cisco, you deal with cities as partners and customers all over the world, so you have a lot of exposure. Do you think, do, do you think it is possible for anyone to help craft a sort of gold standard for the way cities are governed, or are uh, particular circumstances, governments, methods, et cetera, just too idiosyncratic for even anyone to embark on that? You know, if you think in terms, um, and when we, we have over 90 projects that we're engaged in, all the way from the city of Paradesh, uh, near Porto, to Skolkovo in Russia, to, 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 to Bangalore, to uh, London, and then of course Chicago and the other great cities in the world, uh, there's a common thread, and that is there are no standards. Uh, and when we take on projects, especially because it's so hard, and so many cities wanting to do things, we look at five things. Uh, one is visionary leadership. Do they have a vision? There's a clarity of vision. Second one is global standards. You take a look at you know, the phones, airlines, take any industry that is global, there are global standards. Cities have no global standards. Uh, and no two cities are managed the same way, no two cities have the same structure, the no c concept. And I can go into examples to just bring up all the way from mm -hmm. you know, Melbourne to, to India. Uh, the third one, of course, we talk about smart regulation. This, this is not a trivial point. Uh, you know, you are sp we are spending money globally on things that just don't need to be done today. And then, of course, ecosystem and public-private partnerships. So coming back to the, the question on um, uh, are there standards, we are working with the city of Barcelona. And Barcelona is creating an entire, because they, it was, uh, Barcelona has been trying to do this infrastructure up, which is, for me, the right way to think about it. You're already investing in infrastructure. How do you connect the dots? And then how do you build on top of it with Barcelona at 22? And the mayor, and this is exciting, the current mayor and the former mayor, even though they were of the opposing parties, the former mayor met with John Chambers, William and me, and the other said, this is the person who might win, I might win. Regardless of who wins, we're gonna follow through on this policy. 
And when we did it this year, the current mayor invited the former mayor to sit in the front seat, and that's a great signal. So the city protocol is a project that we're working with Barcelona, and Barcelona is working with Global City on how do you create common standards, global standards, that we can try to replicate in multiple places. So with Metropolis and with Barcelona, and I know there are other cities thinking in terms of that, and that is something that uh, we, Wim and I, and as we co-lead the smart connected community, that is an area where we are most mm -hmm. passionate about, is how do we rethink the way cities are managed and built? And there are some experiences coming up, and so that's one example. Great, thanks very much. Um, I, I, I'd love to, to hear if there are any comments from the panel before we turn to Mayor Goldsmith about this, this general theme. We can do this now or in the question and answer period, but of this general theme of, you know, can standards really exist or be implemented? I'd love to hear your thoughts. But um, before, well, I uh, think you know, yep, my please. point. I, I, a lot of folks who know me know I make this point all the time. If you go on a major road, it doesn't have to be in the U.S. Any major road, uh, you get off the road and you stop at a stop. You're in the kind of global city. Everything looks alike. I think cities spend a lot of time trying to individualize and localize what they really shouldn't be and don't spend enough time trying to localize what they should be. To wit, if I get off and I'm in a town, I don't know if I'm in one town or another, this town has completely lost its identity. The leadership of that community really ought to be spending time on what gives that community its signature identity where it adds to its livability mm -hmm. as opposed to spending all of its time trying to individualize its payroll and its accounting and its processing and all the things that really don't matter to its life as a city. Great, thanks a lot. Uh, I wanna turn now to, to, to Mayor Goldsmith. And um, just to ask you really, I mean, you've done a lot of work on, on, on the notion of partnerships and, and the role of different stakeholders in, in, in governance. I mean, how is the way governance uh, is shared among these stakeholders, will that, that be different in these future cities that we're talking about in these days or? Well, yes. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's try to use your question as a, integrate some of the other answers. Um, so uh, I think and write a lot about kind of governing by network, right? So you have a, a local city officials, and you know one view is they manage professional bureaucrats, and another is they manage a set of resources that uh, exist in their communities, right? They have levers, they have rhetoric and power and money and convening authority. But there are a lot of assets elsewhere in the community, right? Folks who live in neighborhoods know what they need. Businesses have a platform to innovate. And so uh, we'll, it, there's just not enough government, no matter how good it is, to produce the quality of services necessary in big cities. Uh, in New York City, we had 350,000 employees, but we had 9 million people, right? There, are, there were more problems than there were ability of government to produce. So I think we'll see some changes. Um, the problem, however, is set up by the uh, other speakers is that it's very difficult to get this collaboration correct, right? Because you can't, there is some, there are things that government has to do. Uh, mayor Williams was elected. He was democratically elected as mayor of Washington, D.C. He is responsible for making sure that certain public values, access and equity and, and the like are taken care of. You can't share those in the governance model. But there, it's impossible to deliver those without the quality of the private sector and the NGOs as well. And it's how to get those things right. And, most often in these uh, public-private partnerships, when something goes wrong, it goes wrong on both sides, right? The, the governance structure is uh, inadequately thought out. The quality of contract management is poor. The service levels are not right. Uh, and that allows for this uh, kind of uh, asymmetrical uh, production. So there will be big changes, um, and there'll be uh, lots of opportunity to get them right and to get them wrong. Let, let me just ask you a, a quick question follow-up. Um, you, you've also done a lot of writing on the role of civil society and what, what its, its role should be in this, this sort of sharing of decision-making. What's, what's specific about civil society's role in this, this discussion? Um, well, well, let me, uh, wait, wait. I don't know how many questions you're going to ask. Me, so <laughs> I'm gonna, not I'm many. Gonna, so I'm going to make up a couple answers to questions you might ask. Um, uh, so, so let's, let's, let's back up a second, right? So, so I totally agree with Tony, my colleague and friend, that we need a disruptive change in many of the cities, not disruptive in terms of, of street protests and riots, but disru disruptive in the way government works. 
Uh, and because we have them, we've developed a model, and New York City was maybe one of the best examples in the country of, of uh, because there was so much corruption 100 years ago in New York City, there is a rule now for everything, right? And so government operates vertically, and people live horizontally. Right. And there's, there's command and control, uh, autocratic, hierarchical government that makes sure, right, that the reason we, the way we avoid corruption is to make sure, and the way we avoid the abuse of discretion is to make sure that no public official has any discretion, right? Because then they can't abuse it, right? So it means that bad government employees are not so bad, and it means good government employees can't be good, right? So now the question is, how do we disrupt that? And, and it requires an integration of information and communication across a, a wide range of places. It requires this uh, interaction between the civil society sector and the government sector. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg and, and President Obama at, at different levels have set up kind of social innovation funds to say, here's a pot of money designed to solve this problem. Give us your ideas about how we could do things better and do them in, a, in an engaged sort of way. And, and um, let me, let, let me di diverge for a second and, and, and say the following. I think one of the things we see in new governance, right, and, um, uh, and it's been referenced in, uh, already, is that uh, this rule-based system that treats everyone the same, right? In New York City, if you were a bad contractor or a good contractor, you got equally regulated. If you were a good restaurant or a bad restaurant, you got equally tormented or regulated, depending on what your view would be, right? And, 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 and that's because we have this rule-based system. But today, with big data and analytics, right, we can discern bad from good. We can find trends. We can do predictive solutions. And so what you'll see in the governance of the large city in the future, and obviously Cisco's a lead in this, is the ability now to train employees, to work with civil society, to identify problems. In New York City when I left, we, we were trying to figure out where the next person was going to slip and fall on the street, where the next fire was going to occur, where the next crime was going to occur, instead of the way we do things now, which is we react in these rule-based systems. Now, those that big data and that an analysis allows us to integrate both civil society. For example, Indianapolis, where I was mayor, was a host of the Super Bowl, the uh, football uh, extravaganza, right? And we were able to mine the tweets to find out where people were dissatisfied about their parking or about their crime control or about the crowds and solve those problems before they called us, right? So the ability now to listen to civil society and to innovate is, is much broader and much greater. And I think this will be the opportunity we'll see for what some of us call the co-production of public services, government, government organizing and listening and co-producing with civil society. Can I, can I pick up on that? Because I think uh, I, I just want to give you two examples of something that happened to me just in the last, I would say, the last couple of months that not only illustrates your point, but also the challenges. I went to one of the great cities of the US to meet with the mayor. I won't mention it because I don't want to embarrass the mayor. Uh, the mayor had invited and said, can you come in and sit down and let me think through because it's election time. So now I've narrowed it down for those of you who want to do Google, <laughs> you can find it. Now what is interesting is before I got to meet with him, his, one of his assistants came to me and said, you need to fill out one more form, so let's go down. So I went down one floor to sign a form and that form was to register me as a lobbyist. So I said, what do you mean I'm a lobbyist? He says, no, if you're going to meet with the mayor, you have to be registered as a lobbyist, and I have to pay $500 to be registered as a lobbyist. <laughs> so I said, $500 is not a problem, but I am not getting registered as a lobbyist because I'd be damned if I'm a lobbyist. Forget about the fact that, you know, there are decent lobbyists, but the fact that I have to <laughs> sign as a lobbyist. Then, no this is where it got even weirder, said, you have to then come six, within the next six weeks and go through a full day training on lobbying. And I was going to sit down with the mayor to discuss about public-private partnership on investing in the city. Right. And so I said, I'm sorry, this is very interesting, very good, but I'm leaving. Uh, I will have somebody from my organization who is registered as a lobbyist to come to meet with the mayor. The mayor's chief of staff came running down saying, Mr. Manon, don't go anywhere. Please stay here. Please stay here. Don't come up to the next floor, but stay here. <laughs> and then I think they negotiated for the next 45 minutes with three lawyers from three different functions where suddenly the mayor ran into me in the lobby. And then we had an hour and a half long conversation that is not officially a discussion. This 
in this context, how do you have public-private partnership when you are not creating the context for the right innovation? I want to take another point, which is how do you work? And this is the second problem that you see, which is to forget about rules and regulation. This is in the city of Bombay. So Mumbai, uh, as it is called now, my birthplace, um, we are talking about electricity, water utilities. There's 54% leakage in the utilities of Bombay. 54% of electricity is wasted in Bombay. It has extreme electric problems. So I'm sitting with the mayor and, well, not the mayor, there are no mayors that are making any decisions in India, but uh, with the equivalent municipality organization. And I talked about the utility, how it's connected. And one of the senior political advisors said, Anil, come with me, let's go to Dharavi which is the largest slum in the world. He drove me to the Aravi and he walked through the Aravi and I saw from one electric poles, 30, 40, 50 lines of electricity going into small shacks. And he said, that's where the leakage is. By the way, take a look at where it ends up. On every one in red letters, there's a number with alphabetical things. He said, each of those are votes. You try to cut that off, I will cut your head off. He <laughs> said, these are my voters. Forget about 54% utility leakage, that is my vote bank, you're not touching that. So how do you change the regulations when you have these constructs? Those are the challenges that I think mayors deal with on a daily basis, that businesses don't know how to deal with. That's why the public-private partnership becomes so critical. But let me just respond real quick, this is a really interesting example. Let me respond really quickly with two P3s, public-private partnership examples. So. Many years ago, when I was mayor of Indianapolis, we did uh, the first U.S. large outsourcing of our water and wastewater plants. And just to kind of make the story short, uh, in the end, uh, actually one of the sponsors here, un now called United Suez, won the contract, but they took all of the city employees and the union, but they provided the management, right? And we'll leave out the details of it, but what was fascinating was over time, Right, costs came down, and uh, but the city maintained control of the policy issues. Fifteen years later, I was in New York City. I said, "Let's try the same thing." New York, New York City Department said, "We're we're the most professional in the country, in the world, and it's very unlikely that model will work for us." And I said, "Okay, well, let's do it differently. Let's just issue a request for proposal and say, um, anybody in the world who has a better idea about how we can manage our water and wastewater system, and here leakage is actually literally leakage, right? So <laughs> tell us how to do it, right? And, and the best folks in the world competed, Veolia and, and United, and the winning bidder provide, brought their management talent and technology into the department, right? So it's, it's an unusual P3, and we'll identify tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars of savings inside the enterprise, and the reason is because the the international scope of the technology and management of those players. I mean, when I did the Indianapolis's water and wastewater, United had more PhDs and engineers than I had employees. Correct. Right? So there's no way that I could compete with them. My workers were pretty good. My blue collar workers were pretty good, but I couldn't compete at the management level. So I think when we say P3s mm -hmm. and, and, pu and public private partnerships and privatization, it doesn't have to mean the sale of the Correct. asset exactly. uh, where we have this kind of inherently uh, adversarial Correct. relationship. Exactly. Interesting. Are there any comments on any of this from, from the panelists? Otherwise, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it to the, to the audience. Do we have any microphones? Let's get those. Yeah, there's one. Any I comments? I think Lady Barbara has a question. Lady Barbara, please. If, if I could just ask anybody asking questions to just introduce yourself very briefly. Thanks. My name is Barbara Thomas Judge, and I'm currently chairman of the UK Pension Protection Fund. And I have a question about New York, where I used to live 20 years ago. Now I live in London. When I lived in New York, I used to say that it was the triple threat of the Ds. It was dirty, it was dangerous, and it was dysfunctional. And it was a horrible place to live, actually. And when I went back last week, none of those things applied. And over the, it was safe, it seemed to work, and it wasn't dirty. So what is it that the mayors did because when I lived there, it was Beam and Koch. Subsequently, I remember it's Giuliani and Bloomberg. Maybe there was a mayor in between, I'm not sure. But what did they do that was right that made New York be the booming town that it is, reclaiming so much of Tribeca and various areas of the city, which used to be relatively useless? And, and how can we replicate that in other places? Very well, thank you. I sat next to you on a plane from 
somewhere to, uh, like a year ago to New York. And we talked. But you didn't ask me that question because I didn't. <laughs> I know you were talking about Tommy. I was afraid to c uh, confide. I was deputy mayor of New York at the time for fear you <laughs> might have a complaint. Um, so uh, this question is really interesting. I think it's a very interesting question. And, and um, uh, v different folks would have different answers. But, but basically it says, you know, some two decades ago, a decade and a half ago, uh, there was a view in the United States that New York City was hopelessly in a downward spiral. It was dirty, it was crime-ridden, people were scared of it, et cetera. And today, obviously, the story is quite, the, quite different. And you have a, mayors with different uh, um, approaches. So one approach, I think, that we should pay attention to is, is Rudy Giuliani's approach, which basically said, Look, we need, and this is the kind of Tony Williams approach, we need big, bold, transformative changes. We do not have to s accept expectations are, as they are today. And that was, a, that was in the area of crime, right? Because nothing works if people are scared. Nothing works if they're scared. And, and so to go from a, we'll tolerate anything on the streets of New York to what many of you know is kind of the broken windows, we'll, we're, we'll, we're going to have a, a much more um, aggressive approach, was c a combination of Rudy saying it and everybody believing he meant it, and dramatic professional changes in a police department that became much more performance-oriented. Uh, performance so what, what often we have in, in the world are mayors that say the right thing and operations that can't deliver, right? And so you, you can't do one without the other. And that combination, Bill Bratton, very professional police department, moved up and, and actually thousands and thousands of police officers added, and that changed, and it changed the environment. And the one way to think about this uh, is, is, the, is the following. What, what the reduction of crime did in New York City was increase property values and revenues, right? Because it, 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 the crime is a tax. And so he eliminated that tax or reduced it dramatically. Now, Mike Bloomberg, for whom I worked, Rudy's a friend, I worked for Mike, uh, was, um, was totally committed to uh, performance management and to the uh, to technologies and, and, and technical nature of running the city, right? So. There was, there was, everything was measured every day. Everybody had a benchmark. Everybody had a, uh, a dashboard, and you managed around it. Now, the, the, the problem, I'd say, going forward is that this, these big changes need to be sustained in a period of fewer resources. So I think the professional platform that Giuliani and Bloomberg brought now needs to be challenged by kind of the Tony Williams uh, hypothesis that we still need, even in good times, or maybe especially in good times, transformative change is necessary and possible, and that's the challenge going forward. Please. I think one of the interesting conclusions of that is that, by contrast to what we said this morning, public policy makes a big difference. So when you do have uh, capa collective capacity of various actors to produce something on the long term, it makes a major, major change on cities. And we have examples of that, not just in New York, but in other cities in the world. So it does make a big difference. The second thing is, is of course, if we take this example from New York, and we try to say the best practice in some other parts of the world, if I can be a bit provocative, we have seen some attempt to apply the Giuliani strategy in different parts of the world, Mexico, and that was an utter, utter, utter failure. So again, this is the point I want to make. Yes, the logic of trying to create collective action and to find some virtuous circle with good private firms and good government and capacity to get some virtuous circle is essential. But trying to apply best recipe right. in a very naive way, the Giuliani example is a very good example of what can work <coughs> and what can fail miserably. And we know so many cities who hired some great consultant looking at the best practice of New York mm -hmm. and which have failed miserably. Yeah. That's the point I wanted to make. Sure. Yes. Hazem Galal from PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, given that most of the infrastructure investments are going to be in cities from emerging and developing uh, countries, the whole notion of governance and continuity to give guarantees to the private sector so that you, know, you invest in a project and if the government changes after four or five years, you're still guaranteed some kind of flow of revenues. I wanted to hear the panel's thoughts on their experience in trying to deal with the lack of continuity. And I was delighted to hear the Barcelona example from uh, Anil. Uh, 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 let, me, let me react to that by first um, maybe challenging the basic premise that the spend 
is going to be more in the new cities, the greenfield cities, whether it's the Qatar or whether it's in China or India. If you, if you take a look at cities worldwide, uh, the Londons of the world, uh, there's actually more spend, except they're already in a budget. And the challenge there, it is not in a one budget that you can track. That is why it is so difficult to do things in London or Barcelona or Mexico or Bombay or some others. And then you go into a city, whether it's Chongqing or whether it's Chengdu or some others in China, it's a little different for many reasons that is there. But I'll take that as, as a point because I think your, your basic point is so true. The city that we talked about this morning, Songdo. Songdo is a city uh, in Incheon, the Ifeza uh, Authority. There too, we had the same situation. We did everything possible working with Mayor An, who was from one party, and right in the middle of it, he gets replaced when North Korea dumps a missile and some things happen, and suddenly the mayor is gone, Mayor Song comes in with a total different view. But the challenge and the ch strategy should always be then this notion that you don't align with one political party, you try to work with all the key stakeholders. And the opposition and the governing are very critical. So we don't take any political position, but if you want to work in this infrastructure area, you have to think in terms of a long-term, 20-year, 15-year window, and we need to stick around as businesses. The number one question I hear from all mayors is, are you looking at this two quarters, three quarters down the road, are you going to be here as we build this all out? And that takes tremendous guts on part of a company to say, as long as we see a business proposition, we will be here and we will continue. But your, your basic point is correct. You cannot look at, that's why this is a separate organization and that we need in Cisco, it's totally separate from the mothership because we have to think differently with different business models. And I think this multi-year, you'll be surprised when we go into, uh, at a city level, I won't talk national level, city level there's a lot more partnership because everybody has worked with each other and they tend to work much more, at least my experience. So I'll leave it at that. And I'm sure the mayor, uh, both the mayors will have a different point of view or maybe the same point of view. I you think it, you know, to uh, echo what we've been hearing about these networks, these relationships, this broader community, uh, I think it's uh, kind of fool's errand to think, well, there's some kind of organizational structure that's going to allow for continuity in and of itself. In other words, we can have a bunch of self-interested fools and with the right structure, we'll still have continuity. I think that's a fool's errand because it often won't work, it'll be substandard. I think the way to think about it is, and I'm speaking from experience where there wasn't continuity on some of my projects, is you really have to take the time. If you think you've spent enough time, spend 50% more time with your workers, with your business leadership, with your neighborhood groups to build an appetite for whatever this outcome is so that it will survive administrations because you know the folks who can kind of like uh, cause mischief in you know the political figures they're responding to these stakeholders so take the time to build that kind of uh, unity of purpose goal alignment among all of them right so that you foster that continu continuity it's very very important that's a great point please uh, in the front, Esther. Well, I'll give you the mic. Yeah. Yeah. Th thank you, Esther Dyson. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the governability of cities versus the governability of nation states. It seems that uh, there's so many examples of federal governments that simply aren't working. And at the same time, cities seem to be able to be a place where you can experiment. and you can do things that might be a violation of civil rights on some formal, in some formal way that you can do in a city you can't do in a country, ranging from taxes on food to make people healthier to restrictions on people's behavior, partly because people are freer to move from cities. Is that true? Can you take cities and turn them into states something to do also with Paul Romer's notion of charter cities. Mm, correct. Who'd like to answer I'll that? Let, I'll let the mayor start first. I could speak from personal experience. If you talk about Greece, uh, who is it now? Greece, Italy, potentially Spain, no offense to Spaniards here, uh, you know, where we're talking about uh, a professional manager to come in and run the place. This is a whole tension between the rational and the political and the at will versus the thought. 
uh, in Washington, D.C., like in New York, like in Philadelphia, like in Cleveland, right, you had this in intervention by a higher level of government that said essentially you can't govern your affairs. We have to bring in a professional public manager to run things. That's, who, that's how I came to Washington, D.C. I wasn't on a trip and my car broke down. I actually came to Washington, D.C. I wor was working in the Clinton administration. The city went bankrupt. I was looking for you know, transformation, excitement, and it certainly provided it. I went over and I worked as a financial manager of the city. So there was this notion that the politics weren't working. You needed this massive, concentrated intervention to reset right, the politics and the governance and get it right. Uh, so that's number one. But I also learned something else, and that is you can make, and I can speak with authority on this, you can make very difficult decisions and survive politically. I totally don't buy this notion that, this kind of Joan of Arc notion that, well, you know, if I want to make good decisions, I'm going to be a martyr. And that's just the cost of making good decisions. I, c I think that's crap. That's not true at all. You know, when I was a financial manager of the city, I laid off thousands of people. I actually went to a Republican Congress. I'm a Democrat and got at will personal authority and fired hundreds of people on my own accord, and I was actually drafted to run for mayor. And then I closed the hospital, and for those of you who go back on YouTube now and watch some of these community meetings around the closing of the hospital, this was hugely controversial. Everybody said, this is the end of Tony Williams, and unfortunately for my detractors, I was reelected again overwhelmingly. So this notion that you can make tough decisions in a local environment and survive is not true. What it requires, I think, is leadership that's not condescending and patronizing to people. And I would argue to your question about New York, I would say what I have in whatever other differences there are, what I have in common with someone like a Rudy Giuliani <coughs> or a Michael Bloomberg is a really good leader is not condescending to his or her people. They basically say, you know, you elected me to basically be the mayor. 70% of the time, I really am like the maitre d'. I'm taking dinner orders. That's <laughs> essentially my job. But 30% of the time, you elected me to really lead. And here's where I want us to go. Just two, uh, just maybe one postscript. Um, of course, I agree with Tony. But the other thing is, you know, cities are, cities are inherently pragmatic places, right? And so the fact that you have to pick up the trash or provide crime control uh, uh, trumps and overrides the polarization that occurs at the national level, right? Because in, in the U.S. Congress, you can argue about policies all day because you don't really actually have to do anything, right? Just set, I mean, you should, but you can just argue about in In city government, you have practical things to do, and that, that pragmatism allows you to, if organized well, and you produce the, the, the quality services you need to make these <coughs> Big changes make these because you have this pragmat this pragmatism of daily quality of service then allows you to reach over and above that to do bigger things because people can see that you're producing, and I think that uh, mayors I think in the U.S. at any rate are probably the least political in terms of the good mayors in terms of how they produce services and I think there's a theme there. Great. Uh, let me just please. I'm, I think it's very interesting. I don't think I agree with your non-political as a good mayor, probably the U.S. example. But the problem when we contrast cities and state is that we take state as we compare Luxembourg with China. So yeah. the problem is that the category state means so different things that it's very hard to answer your question. And again, what is true for the U.S. would be very different in middle-sized, small European countries or in India and China for a different scale. So the problem is that we cannot generalize, I think, for these sort of things. And the examples we have given are very precise <coughs> and important. But again, the generalization on you know, states and cities, again, you have city-states, as one example we see, are developing. But there are lots of places in the world where what is going on in the cities is also linked to the nation state. And it's in fact, the current pattern is really a mix of the two all the time. So the opposition between the two is, is you know, we should try to avoid that as much as we can, except in some cases. I would like to, to emphasize that. On the political thing, if I bear to disagree with uh, my, my predecessor on the speak, it depends. I know lots of pragmatic mayors, which in the name of being pragmatic, don't do very much. And I know also mayors with political visions who do lots of interesting things because they are political, or the other way around. You know, generalizing on this criteria, for me, is very debatable. If you go out of 
one specific country. I could answer for France or Italy on your on these questions. But if you generalize, and if you think about Chinese cities, you can see some very different thinking. Mm. So if you think of being pragmatic or political, I don't think it's the main variable. And I think the question of leadership and where you want to go and where you bring various groups together, as, as the two mayors have been emphasizing, is really this collective action element, which is central. And I'll just add one point to Esther Dyson's question, which is if you take a look at the country level and then the state level, or even at the city level, what is most dramatic is the tyranny of averages start kicking it at the country level. What I mean by that is uh, decisions are not very clear. The averaging effect is much more. And I was talking to Wim this morning when we were driving to the uh, hotel that one of the most interesting paradoxical things, and if you go back to the US, is that if you ask an average person, what do you think of the Congress? 86% said they suck, they should be fired. What do you think of the congressman? They should all be fired. But then you ask, what about your own congressman? No, no, he's doing a good job. Which is why 96% or 94% of congressmen get reelected, while people think on an average 86% of them are doing a lousy job, should be fired. Governors, chief ministers, don't have that luxury of running away. They are accountable, and then they are much more on a short term. You can see the impact of a mayor on a city or on a state level. So you see a lot more value and additions. Even if you look at a country like India, one of the most sick states of India, which is always considered to be was Bihar. For those of you who have gone back and studied the re revolution in Bihar, there is one where you show that visionary leadership with tough actions does show some result. And the chief ministers are more likely to behave like chief executives than I would argue a country leader. Great, thanks a lot. I know there are lots of people who want to ask questions, so let, let's take, take a few and try to make the questions, and we'll try to make the answers short so we can get through a lot. Let's start here in the front. A quick question. Uh, open data is a policy in many places. In New York City, it became law in March. I'd be interested in uh, hearing what you all have to say about the role of open data, the democrat democratization of information in making cities uh, a better place to live. So I'd love to s talk for about an hour about this question, <laughs> but in a minute. Um, so the transparency and open data initiatives uh, are great, but they produce value when they're intentionally connected to community action. So if you make data open that nobody can actually use very well, it's nominal. And so the steps in New York City of open data, open three one uh, call center data, uh, open results on how long it takes to solve a problem. Now we're delivering to community groups in a way that they can do with that data any way they want to make discoveries or uh, communicate policies from their neighborhood. So the connection of those themes will be one way to have much more community action, I think. There was a question back, back there. Hello, uh, Bassam Manai from uh, Mashera Properties. Um, um, I'm from Qatar, and uh, the role of uh, real estate, private real estate developers in the city, the city of Doha, has been huge. Um, not only in Qatar, but also in the region, UAE, Saudi, the entire Gulf. So I'm curious uh, to, to ask a question to the panel about the role of private developers in the creation of the new cities and how we could be uh, responsible creators and uh, responsible uh, developers while still uh, maintaining a healthy uh, profit, which is essential to like, our economies. Uh, thank you. May I, may, I, may I take that one? Because that's one of the things that we work on. So whether it is in Qatar or whether, um, you know, whether it's Lend Lease out of Australia that is doing Barangaroo in Sydney or uh, Elephant and Castle in the UK. So we work extensively with real estate, and I'm speaking now from my Cisco hat. And uh, therein comes the adversarial relationship that we always talk about, uh, is the city uh, offers entitlements and then the developers build. But historically, developers have just wanted to zone, block it up, sell it to develop some other sub-developers who will then d build. And so what happens is uh, a lot of uh, uh, developers have not stayed in long enough to operate. They don't think in terms of operating. Uh, now that the boom and bust has kicked in, uh, in the real estate world, as with almost any other business, a lot of very forward-looking real estate developers, whether it's land or lend lease or any of the others that we can think about, including in Qatar, uh, they're looking in terms of new sources of revenue. How do I take my land and then use it to create, whether it's open data, putting in the infrastructure, creating open system, and bringing back. Labasa, 
uh, that uh, Ajit Gulabchand talked about. Labasa is actually trying to go IPO. Imagine a city going IPO. And the whole idea is you're going to pay for the economic development of my city. I would argue that as we go PPP over time, why would it not be necessarily an illogical idea to think about the city GDP as a revenue equivalent for a company and think in terms of an IPO model where you can get in investors and then these developers stay on for a longer period, not just developing, but responsible for operating, creating integrated operation center and delivering services to the tenants who are there. I think that is the area that you can go, and I know Mushairab and the others, you'll are thinking in that term. So it's, uh, it's very exciting, but it has to have a, it's only a small set of individual real estate developers who are thinking in those terms. Great, we'll take uh, two final questions. We'll, we'll take them as a group, one right here and one in the front, and then we'll have to conclude. Thank you very much. Khaled Janahi, um, just admitting that most Hello. of the new city is going to be built up now, it's going to be in the emerging markets and developing countries. And if I use a word of one of uh, a phrase used, which was sustainable development, in most of these countries, the most sustainable development is corruption. Now, from a PPP perspective, and let me use, I think, for Anil, just India as a prime example here. I mean, either you do business through 35 families or through a bureaucracy, which is the layers of corruption are ripe everywhere. Now, how does a private sector entity entering, say, Cisco or anybody else, doing business there and managing the risk of reputational aspect doing there, whether it is India or Qatar or whatever, because that is very, very ripe. Yeah, it is. Uh, every time I take a trip, my lawyer from San Jose always checks where I'm going. Um, and then always checks who I'm meeting. Uh, because you're exactly right. It is one of those challenges that you have. I go back and I read 19, uh, from 1880s to 1910 of the US and Europe, and it is being replicated now in India and Malaysia and Turkey and all the other places. It's exactly almost the same model at work, except 100 years later. Um, and it is, it is a challenge on the reputational side of a large company, especially an MNC, which has got Sarbanes-Oxley on me and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, but it is, if you're going to survive, you're gonna grow, you better learn how to deal with families. Uh, whether it is the five or six, whether it's the Koch and Shabanchi family in Turkey, or whether it's the Adanis and the Ambanis in India, or whether it's the Takshans in Thailand, you better know how the family and the political intertwining goes on. We have to learn to work with it. You can't avoid it because you have to play in that game, but you have to be very careful. You can't go with fly-by-night operators, and don't go with established players, because sometimes established players have no incentive to change things. So you gotta find who are the revolutionaries who are actually gonna be around. So it's a very big <laughs> challenge. Mayor I'll just say very, very briefly, 30 seconds. You know, I come into, again, public life as a financial person. It makes me wanna just vomit when I see the criminal, like, theft of <laughs> billions of dollars of people's wealth going into developed countries and just, and I would just say that there just as uh, good leadership, but, uh, and this is where local level comes in. If you think of major social movements, we think of cities, and I think we're in need of a new social movement, and I think we well see it, especially with modern technology, that is disruptive and breaks up some of these oligarchies and, mon and corrupt monopolies. I do believe that, that that day is going to come because people aren't dumb and they're on to this. Very, f very last question here in the front. Selene Salomon de Carvalho from Brazil, and uh, I'm running for mayor in my small city in Brazil this, uh, this year, and that's the reason I'm here. And uh, from what he said behind there, and you too, um, Tony, it's uh, crazy. Brazil. Uh, spent 30 billion euros last year on, on public money on, on corruption. So it's not an easy task. And uh, one of the, re the reasons I'm running is to see, could that be change as, as uh, a normal citizen maybe starting getting in and, and, and change the, 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 the way that uh, politics run in Brazil? And uh, what I want to know is we're talking about fantastic cities with great mayors, with a lot of investment in, in education and all that. We don't have any of that in Brazil. Uh, we're talking about how do we uh, split the money between uh, different companies and, and corrupt politicians. So what is the recommendation and is that hope for Brazil, uh, even though we are? in the media right now and that Brazil is, is a great country and all that. Politi politically and socially, we're hurting a lot. 
and uh, what the suggestion would be <coughs> for someone that never been in politics and, and believe that Joanna Dark still exists. Is there any, is there a 30 second recommendation for Brazil you <laughs> could both <laughs> make? Exactly, <laughs> small country. I, I, I mean, I just, think, I just think there have to be, you need global focus and global financing of this effort, but it has to be expressed locally using tools like social networking and social engagement. So there's a group, it's a great group and I know some of them, Transparency International, it's about finding out where Mobutu's money went and Markle's money, I'm dating myself, all these guys, where their money went, you know, but how do you try to translate that to a local level, disrupt and provide transformative change at a local level? I actually don't know, but I know it's gonna happen. Great, I, I wanna thank, uh, first of all, thank the panelists very much, uh, and thank you, the audience.